I'm Lenny Rome, uh, professor of biological chemistry, former research dean. Uh, Judy Gasson, who's the new research dean, who I was hoping I could introduce you to today, is, uh, is uh, actually overwhelmed with her new job, so she asked me to come today and introduce Paul, which I'm happy to do. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the people who make this uh, research series possible. Uh, the main sponsor is now the Research Administrators Campus Committee, uh, or the RAC as it's better known, and uh, this is a very hardworking group, and uh, uh, if you uh, don't know uh, much about the RAC and want more information, I think Terry Novar is still the RAC uh, chair and she can help you. I want to thank the development uh, 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 department, uh, Zoe Cotton and others who helped us uh, develop the biobasic concept, and then Dion Baybridge and Rosalie Encarnacion who are uh, walking in the door, who uh, are staff in the, uh, in the dean's office who uh, do the heavy lifting to make sure that you get a nice lunch today. Uh, but, uh, for, but finally, I really want to thank the research administrators who are here because you guys really make it possible for us, Paul and I, to do our research and we're very happy about that and therefore you can, it's very gratifying to know that whenever we approach faculty and ask them if they would like to give talks about their research to non-researchers and we tell them who it is, they're always very uh, anxious to come here and talk to you as, as was Paul. <laughs> so today's speaker, uh, Paul Masavich, is somebody who I've known for, believe it or not, 30 years. I guess we were childhood friends if it was 30 years ago. Uh, I was very precocious. Yes, right. So uh, uh, we met when Paul was an assistant professor in the Department of Anatomy, and he joined what used to be called the Mental Retardation Research Center, which was a center where I was also a member. Uh, it's now been, the name has been changed to the, this is the first I've heard of this because it's changed its name three times, to the UCLA Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center. So I suppose that has some kind of a roll off the tongue. Uh, Paul got his PhD at the University of Minnesota and he carried out postdoctoral work at the Mayo Clinic before he came to UCLA. He was uh, promoted to full professor in 1992 uh, in the Department of Neurobiology, and he's also a full professor in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery, which happened uh, back in 1998. Paul's lab focuses on three major problems, uh, uh, steroid hormone interactions with the, uh, all uh, involving steroid hormone interactions with the central nervous system. They include the modulation of, of opioid receptors by steroids, the regulation of steroid biosynthesis by the brain, and the direct action of estrogens on neurons, uh, not through genetic interactions, but direct interactions. And I imagine he's going to combine those interests today. He didn't tell me, but I imagine he's going to combine those in his talk today, which is sex, drugs, and spines, something that I'm sure there's something for everyone here. <laughs> uh, the control of reproduction. And without further ado, again, I want to thank Paul Savage for being our speaker today. Thanks, Lenny. So first, I was told to thank you. Turn down the lights so you can all see. And I think most of the slides will project with the lights on, so I'm not going to uh, turn the lights off. Besides, I'm afraid you might fall asleep. Um, so you know, uh, there was a there was a professor at UCLA. My first encounter with a professor at UCLA, um, John Liebeskind. John Liebeskind was a professor in uh, psychology. He was a member of the National Academy of Science, and I was at a meeting with him. And he refused to turn off the lights. He said, I was giving a talk once. I had the lights off. And then the projector went bad. We turned the lights on. You were all asleep. <laughs> so I'm never going to turn the lights off again. So same thing with you. I'm going to keep the lights on. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an introductory slide. This is uh, Venice a couple of years ago. Um, and since we're going to talk about sex, I thought I'd set the mood appropriately. Uh, this is a Campari and soda, and this is an Aperol spritz, and you can take your pick and uh, sit back and enjoy. Um, so before I, I, I launch into uh, the main topic, I need to give a little bit of an introduction. So most of the work uh, that I do and all of the work that I'm going to talk about today has to do with the hypothalamus. And as uh, Sidney Brenner said in a moment of weakness once, only the hypothalamus is the real brain. The other parts are only decorations. <laughs> and so here in this, in this red uh, shading is the hypothalamus. So all of this, the rest of the stuff that you think is important 
useless. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, your thumbnail is the size of the hypothalamus. All right, so, and look how big your, your head is, look how much um, brain matter. Now, why is the hypothalamus important? Why am I interested in it? Why was uh, Sidney Brenner um, moved to say such things? Uh, because the hypothalamus controls what we technically call the four Fs. And the four Fs are feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. <laughs> I don't know what you guys were thinking, but <laughs> it's not that kind of talk. <laughs> the other player that's important, and, and as Lenny said in my introduction, I am obsessed with, with estradiol. Um, so estrogens uh, are a class of compounds. They're steroid compounds. And estradiol is the major estrogen that we have in our body. And it is the most bioactive uh, estrogen that we have. And estrogen comes from primarily from the developing follicle in the ovary. So as the follicles develop, these cells that surround the developing follicle make estrogen. And they release it into the circulation, and it uh, affects uh, the, the body in general. In the rat, the 28-day menstrual cycle that humans have, primates have, is compressed, condensed into a four-day estrous cycle. And this is what the steroid levels look like. This is estrogen in blue, and in teal, or whatever color that is, um, you have progesterone. And when estrogen peaks, right before progesterone reaches its peak, ovulation happens in the rodent. And it's followed immediately by something we call behavioral estrus. This is when the animal is receptive. This is when the animal has sex. Okay? Rodents, unlike people, have sex only at specific parts of their, their cycle. And no matter what else happens, unless the hormonal environment is proper, they, the female doesn't care. All right. So this is, this is important for you to just Keep in the back of your head, we'll, we'll talk all about it, but you, the, the hormonal milieu, the hormonal environment is, is absolutely critical. So the other thing that I want to uh, tell you about in, in terms of background is, is that all steroids come from a cholesterol backbone. So all steroids are derivatives of cholesterol. And you know the, I can show you a lot of, of uh, biosynthetic schemes. Uh, What's really important, what I want you to keep in mind, is that estrogen or estradiol is the final product. Testosterone, which males have a lot of floating around in their body, is really a pro-hormone to estrogen. And a lot of the effects that, that you think of as being masculinizing, as being masculine, are really driven by estradiol. There's, a hormone, there's, a, there's an enzyme in the brain called aromatase that converts testosterone to estrogen. And then estrogen acts on receptors within cells to uh, mediate those functions. And the way it, the effect of steroids is described in textbooks is, is that these receptors for estrogen live in the nucleus. And then when bound by estradiol, they then sit on a specific part of the DNA called an estrogen response element and either facilitate or inhibit transcription. And um, so for many, many years, this is the kind of picture that we took of not just the brain, but of all steroid accumulating um, organs in the body. And that is, this is radioactive estrogen, it's an autoradiogram, and it shows estrogen accumulation in the nucleus. And so we thought for many, many years that, that all estrogen receptors lived in the nucleus and all estrogen receptor effects were dependent on this transcription. As Lani said, this is, this is no longer true. We know that estrogen have direct effects on a lot of cells, specifically neurons, uh, but I'm not going to talk very much about that today uh, because, um, as the title says, I have uh, other things that I need to talk about. But, since I spend a lot of my time looking at other effects, I, I have to at least give you a background. So direct nuclear action is the stuff that I just described for you. 
What I work on a lot now is this membrane estrogen receptor. And this is, as one of my colleagues said, a horrible quagmire because we now have at least five or six different molecules that may be estrogen receptors on the membrane. Part of the problem with those molecules is that a number of them, um, all we know about them is their pharmacology. We don't know anything about their genes. We don't know anything, what, what kind of protein it is. It's completely uncharacterized, but we have a lot of very interesting effects. And they're driven, as I said, by pharmacology, which is very old school uh, in the 21st century. But these membrane estrogen receptors either very rapidly activate or shut down ion channels, or they activate kinase cascades, which eventually end up in gene transcription. So although we start with different places, membrane-initiated signaling or nuclear-initiated signaling, we end up back here in the nucleus regulating transcription. And what does that mean? Transcription means we're making new proteins. And to give you an idea of, of the, the vast array of proteins, um, Jake Lucis in the Department of Human Genetics did a study where he looked at the livers of males and females. He found 800 different genes selectively regulated by estrogen. So it, it, what we're talking about is a huge impact on any particular organ. And the liver, uh, at least in my mind, is not something I consider a very uh, steroid responsive structure. Now, I'm not going to go through the evidence, but you can find estrogen receptors in virtually every single cell in the brain. And what I have here is a map of the areas that are most responsive to steroids. And I want to show you that down here is the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. And so this is an, a very, very hot area for estrogen action in the brain. The other place that's very uh, abundant in steroid receptors is the midbrain. And uh, the midbrain is the pathway of circuits that are going to escape the hypothalamus and go down to regulate behavior. So all of these structures here are responsive, very responsive to, to steroids. So why study estradiol? Why study sex? Um, first of all, maybe it's fun. Um, <laughs> But um, I'm a neurobiologist, so by the time I get done with sex, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> and so when, when Mark asked me to speak and then, and then said, make the title some, somehow catchy, provocative, what could I do? I had to put sex in the title. Um, and since I work on opiate receptors, there was drugs. So. Um, so I said receptors act rapidly and slowly, and they prime reproductive circuits. Uh, estradiol changes metabolism and structure of cells in the nervous system, and it acts both developmentally and in adulthood. And I just want to show you uh, one thing that you've probably heard about over and over again, and that is that there are sexual dimorphisms in the brain. Okay, UCLA is like the mecca of sexual dimorphisms. Uh, both Roger Gorsky, uh, who discovered sex differences in the rodent brain, and Art Arnold, who discovered sex differences in the avian brain, are here. And um, I think the, the biggest splash was, um, in some ways, was, was Roger Gorsky's work. And Roger Gorsky, back in 1978, showed that in a particular part of the hypothalamus, the male part of that structure was larger than the female part. And I remember, I was a graduate student at the time, and I remember, and I had read that paper, and I thought, that's just crap. So I took a rat, sectioned the brain, stained it, and held it up to the light. And that's how evident the sexual dimorphism is. It's really dramatic. Um, so this is the rat, and there are now a lot of sexual dimorph dimorphisms described in the rat. None of them are, are probably as, um, uh, dramatic as this one, but, but there are a lot. And there's one that Roger Gorsky, a graduate student in Roger Gorsky's lab, discovered in the human brain. And it was the first of many sexual dimorphic structures in the brain. And in the homologous area in the human brain, 
uh, they discovered four little nuclei, and they named them the interstitial nuclei, nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus. And so rather than say that, they call them ENA, ENA 1 through 4. Turns out that they're, they're, slightly, ENA, they're slightly larger in males than there are in females. After um, this publication, Simon LeVay, uh, then down at, in San Diego uh, at the Salk, looked at uh, the brains of homosexuals. And he published a paper in Science, and he said this nucleus, ENA3, was exactly between male size and female size. All right. Now, I, I bring this up only historically. There, there are a lot of problems with that study. And, and we, I don't want to spend a lot of time going into that. But the point is, is that just like in the rodent, the human brain has sexual dimorphisms. What they mean is a different story. All right? And I don't say that facetiously, because this structure, although it's tremendously um, apparent and is easily inducible by changing the steroid environment during development, we still don't know what the function is. Okay? That's not for lack of trying. But we don't know what the function of the sexually dimorphic part of the medial preoptic area. Probably has to do with male sexual behavior, because that's this area indeed has to do with male sexual behavior, but we still don't know. All right. So to me, one of the important parts of, of estradiol is that it imposes a particular state on the nervous system. Um, other states are things like sleep, wafel cycles, stress, depression. These are all global effects on the nervous system. And so the nervous system with estrogen is different than the nervous system without estrogen. And it's something that's not widely appreciated. Uh, and we would be in a lot more trouble with a lot of the research, except that most people use male rats. And they use male rats uh, because males have a more or less constant level of gonadal steroids floating around. And so the state issue isn't a problem. In my lab, the state issue isn't a problem either because all rats come ovariectomized. Right. So, because I study steroids, I want to give them exactly the kind of steroids and in the amounts that I want. So we just order them without, without their, their gonads. And in rodents, I, as I said, estradiol induces the state of sexual receptivity. And we measure this by something called lordosis behavior. And now it's time for those of you who are squeamish to uh, avert your eyes because then we're going to show one picture of rat pornography. <laughs> So this is the sex in the title, all right? I, I, uh, I have a short video, but I thought that'd be too much. <laughs> so I, th this, this is done so that you, you don't mistake the characters. The white rat is the female, and the ugly one with the hood on, that's the male. So this is a Spragdali, and this is a Long Evans rat. And the male is mounting the female. And she go, takes on what's known as a lordotic posture, hence the name lordosis. And what that is is an arching of the back and a diversion of the tail and so that the male can intermit. So uh, different rodents have different um, uh, aspects of this behavior. For example, uh, a rat will, will take this posture for only a, a second or two. A mouse very, very rapidly. It's, it's, it's a very hard to even, even see the behavior. Um, guinea pigs, for example, will hold that posture for five minutes. Okay, so it, it all, but they all have the same kind of lordotic posture. So I'll refer to that as lordosis or lordosis behavior. It's a reflex. This is not something that the female controls. Okay, and when we test it, it's very artificial because we're just testing this reflex. In nature, the female is actually controlling the behavior. She comes out of her burrow, and then the male mounts her. When she is not interested in the male, she doesn't come out. 
So she completely controls this behavior. And there's a way that we can study this. It's called a pacing paradigm, where the female can escape from the male. And when it does that, we get slightly different um, results. And what we're looking at there is motivation of behavior. I'm not looking at motivation of behavior. I'm looking at the response of a circuit. It's a reflex to this male mounting the female. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to, we're going to look at um, a circuit in the brain. And I'm not going to go through all of this circuit. It's not really important. But what's important for you to, uh, to know is, is that it's a global circuit. It's not, it's not like uh, the patellar reflex where you, you hit the um, kneecap and your, and your uh, leg swings up. This re requires the whole of the nervous system and the, um, the whole body of the animal to undergo. It's modified by chemosensory inputs, olfactory inputs, visual inputs, um, auditory inputs, um, and also tactile inputs that are coming up from the spinal cord. Turns out that the flank stimulation as the male mounts the female is exceedingly important, as is the stimulation of the, of the perineum. And then all of this information is integrated and uh, brought together within what we call the limbic hypothalamic circuit. So it can, uh, nuclei such as the bed nucleus, the straight terminalis, the posterior dorsal medial amygdala down here, medial preoptic area, all these areas are highly steroid sensitive and accumulate steroids. So I've just put a cloud of estrogen over all of these things. The final output of this circuit is the ventromedial nucleus of, of the hypothalamus. Okay, so this is like the motor neurons uh, of this limbic hypothalamic circuit. Once they're activated, you have, you have lower doses. If you block this nucleus, no matter what else you do upstream, there will be no behavior. What we're going to look at mostly is this other little nucleus right next to the ventromedial known as the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And the arcuate nucleus is where we think estrogen information is introduced into this circuit. And let me show you. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But before I, I get into that, I need to, to bring in um, one of the other players of my title. And that is, uh, that, uh, that is uh, opiates. So um, more refers to a mu opiate receptor. And mu stands for morphine. So this is an opiate receptor that sees um, morphine. And if we take an animal that's been, been treated with estradiol, she will, she will be receptive. She has a lordosis quotient of 100. If we then give a agonist of this mu opiate receptor, we block the behavior. So the behavior is down. And then if we antagonize the mu opiate receptor and then give the agonist, we restore the behavior. In other words, we've blocked the behavior. Now we've reversed the, the blockade. So opiates are involved in, in this um, system. So those are the drugs of the title, the opiates. So everybody thinks of opiates as either some sort of uh, thing addicts take or uh, something that people take for pain. But opiates have been around for a tremendously long period of time, and they have a lot of different effects. Um, this is, this is just, just for fun. Um, I actually thought that opiates first only appeared in Sumerian ideographs, but then I found that they were actually, uh, uh, they found fossilized um, opium poppy seeds uh, in Neanderthal campsites. Now, one, w one way of interpreting that is that they were using opiates. The other one is that they liked poppy bread, you know, poppy seed bread or humitashin, you know, who knows. Um, but one of the interesting things about the history of, of opiates is, is that uh, Bayer Chemical, the same, and the same executive at Bayer who developed aspirin, which was invented by a guy named Felix Hoffman, he developed heroin for, for Bayer. And heroin was developed as a non-addictive <coughs> morphine. So, you know. Didn't work out so well for Bayer. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about one of the four different kinds of opiate receptors, and these are the mu opiate receptors. 
Okay, they're involved in analgesia, respiratory depression, euphoria, and reproduction. There's a number of other ones, other receptors. Some of them are involved in reproduction, some of them not. I just decided we were just going to talk about one because it's, it's complicated enough with one. Well, this is a different, a different kind of opiate drug called endomorphin. Uh, it has a sorted, sorted past and sorted history, but again, this just shows you if you give endomorphin to an animal, you can reduce the sexual behavior. And if you look around in the brain into the medial preoptic area, uh, what you find is that there are a number of opiate receptors in this medial preoptic area, and they're not in the sexually dimorphic part, which is located right here. This is slightly above that. Um, and what happens is when, they, when you treat an animal with, with endomorphin is, is that these opiate receptors appear to increase in their amount. Turns out they're not, they're not increasing in their amount, they're being internalized. And what does that mean? Internalization is the movement of receptors from the cell membrane into endosomes, into the endosomal compartment. And it's, all receptors do this, and it's a way of stopping the signaling. So if you're, you're uh, stimulating a particular circuit too much, the receptors are removed from that cell, from that circuit, they're internalized, they no longer can receive the message. This is what happens when you build up tolerance to, to opiates. All right, the receptors are brought into the cell and they are actually degraded, they're downmodulated. Normally under, under desensitization, these receptors go into early endosomes and then can be recycled back to the membrane. Um, so that's what you're seeing, you're seeing that under the influence of endomorphin, you're driving these receptors inside. Well, it turns out that this also happens with um, estradiol, if only my slides will advance, yes. So here, are the, here is a cell that is in an ovaryectomized animal in the medial preoptic area, in that area that I showed you, and all of its opiate receptors are found on the cell membrane. It's not being activated. That cell is quiescent. If we give estradiol to that animal, all of a sudden we notice that there are a number of these receptors that have been internalized. This is a way that we can look at specific pharmacologically defined receptors and whether they're not activated by particular kinds of stimulation. So here all we did is give estradiol. And what that suggests is that by giving estradiol, we are activating an endogenous opiate circuit. So circuits that exist in, within your brain that use something called endogenous opioid peptides. So these are the same, they, they have the same pharmacological effects as the opiates, morphine, uh, et cetera. Well, how does this whole circuit fit together? Here we go, this is what estrogen does. It activates estrogen receptors in the arcuate nucleus that release neuropeptide Y that cause the release of beta endorphin in the medial preoptic area, causing the internalization of those receptors, and then the animal is not receptive. So this is counterintuitive, right? Everybody knows, I just showed you, I talked all about this, how important estrogen was for inducing the behavior. And now I'm showing you that if I give estrogen, I activate an opiate circuit and I shut down the behavior. What kind of comedy is this? Turns out that the system needs time and space in order to make new proteins, new receptors, new enzymes that are going to be important for the behavior and to make sure that the animal doesn't undergo any kind of sexual receptivity before it's ready, estrogen, which is ultimately facilitatory, is shutting down the circuit because if we wait long enough, the animal becomes lordotic. And I'll show you in, in toward the end how we think all this, is, how all this fits together. But before I do that, 
I have to tell you about spines, because I said sex, drugs, and spines. Right, so what are spines? Spines are a protrusion off of dendrites, which are one of the two kinds of extensions found in neurons. The first extension are axons, the second one are dendrites. And what's been labeled in red is every place there's a spine on these neurons that are in culture. So what do they look like in, in a different picture, in the kind of picture that, that Ramoni Cajal showed? This is what they look like. These, these spiny dendrites look like almost like bottle brushes. There's so many of them. So that's nice. Who cares? <laughs> this is what a spine looks like at the uh, EM level, electron microscopic level. So here's a dendritic spine. Looks like a mushroom or a lollipop. And look what's around it. These are all axon terminals. So what the, act, what the spine is, is a place for focusing input into neurons. And so if you have more spines, you have more surface area, you have more input that can be brought into that cell. Less spines, less input, less activation. So many, many years ago, um, uh, people noticed that under the influence of estradiol, you could increase the number of spines. So this is, a sp this is a neuron that's located in the hippocampus, not in the hypothalamus. You treat with estradiol, you get a lot of spines. You treat with progesterone, and the number of spines decreases. All right, we didn't want to spend our time counting these spines and, and uh, drawing them. This is very nice, but, but we're a little too impatient for that. So we used um, an immunohistochemical chemical technique where we labeled beta-actin. Beta-actin is the framework that holds spines together. And so if you take and give estradiol to an animal that's ovariectomized, you see that the number, the, the amount of beta-actin, the optical density of beta-actin increases. And this is correlated with the number of spines. All right, just want to remind you that we're going to be looking at this area right here in the arcuate nucleus. This is the area where, as I said, we think that estradiol is beginning its activation of the circuit. It sends a projection to the medial preoptic nucleus. That goes to the ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus, and eventually we get behavior. So that's just to remind you where we are. Well, if you give, <coughs> if you give estro estrogen to an animal, Within a relatively short period of time, and in this first initial experiment that we did, we used four hours. You can use as little as an hour. You can see that a number of these very, very fine filopodial-like spines begin, begin to appear. And if we wait um, some 20 hours where we can actually drive the behavior, we notice that the spines uh, are still there. And we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. What, what is an interesting phenomenon is, is that when spines reach their maximum, they stay elevated for the duration of the time when the animal, 20 to 30, 48 hours, is sexually uh, receptive. If we block um, spines by using a, a chemical called cytochalase and D, which disrupts that framework, we lose the number of spines, and at the same time, so we're doing a site-specific injection into the arcuate nucleus with cytochalase and D. This is a normally receptive animal. This is an animal that's received estradiol, but now it can't make spines. So there are two things that I've showed you that are important for, for the sex behavior. One, opiate receptors, and the second are these spines. So all of these are uh, regulating and driving the behavior. What we noticed is, is that, and I alluded to this, is that the first spines that you form are filopodial. They're, they're long, thin. These are not functional spines. These are, these are just the beginnings. And as they mature in different parts of the brain, they take on slightly different uh, shapes, uh, stubby mushroom or cup shape. They are then biologically active. They are then able to, to regulate and change the, the behavior. And ex exactly what we saw. We saw initially these small, thin 
filipodial spines, and then when the animal was sexually receptive, we saw these mushroom-shaped spines, which we think are, are uh, biologically active. So how does, all this, how does all this work? How do we put this into, into a, a framework? Well, I didn't talk to you at all uh, about uh, membrane estradiol signaling, and unfortunately, it's this membrane estradiol signaling um, that requires a metabotropic glutamate receptor, which is important for the generation of new spines. So in the, in the resting condition, there are a few of these receptors on the membrane, there are a few stable spines, and the animal is basically quiescent. When we treat with estradiol, we activate a uh, protein kinase cascade that phosphorylates this molecule called cofillin. And what cofillin does normally is chew up these actin filaments. If you phosphorylate cofillin, you deactivate it. So you need to phosphorylate it to grow new spines. And that's what you do. You grow these filipodial spines. Now, unless you have gene transcription and also a partner for this newly formed spine, that spine is eliminated. So what we're doing now is trying to figure out what kinds of proteins are necessary and important for stabilizing these spines, as well as trying to figure out the kinds of synaptic partners this spine is, uh, is getting. All right, so I, I mentioned before that I uh, was going to put all this into some sort of uh, larger context. And the, the hormone that I haven't talked to you about at all today is progesterone. And I haven't talked to you about progesterone because as somebody once, as Bill Clinton once said, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> but I'll show you an animation, and, and it'll explain everything. So you can tell your children that you were here when you saw this. So estrogen's coming along. It binds to these NPY neurons um, and releases NPY onto these beta endorphin neurons, which are going to stimulate the mu opiate receptor, which my former postdoc calls MOP for mu opiate receptor. I don't know why he likes MOP better than more, but um, we'll, we'll let him do that. And then what happens is when this beta endorphin activates these, these mu opiate receptor neurons, they are internalized and the lordosis is inhibited. So that's what I showed you. That was the first part. Now, how do you move from inhibition of behavior to having, having sexual receptivity. And the way you do that is the other secret hormone, that's progesterone. And what progesterone does is it activates something called a nociceptin neuron, which then blocks the activity in these POMC neurons, which are releasing beta endorphin. When you do that, the inhibition on these mu opiate receptive neurons is removed. When that happens, the membrane receptors return. So all that's happening is, is that without the stimulation, mu opiate receptors return back to the membrane, and the animal now is no longer being inhibited, and it shows, and it shows lordosis. All right. So there are a number of different actions of, of estradiol, and I only touched on really uh, reproduction. But I'm sure that most of you have heard of, of the fact that estrogen is, um, prevents you from, from overeating. And it turns out that, that the same area that I look at in terms of sex behavior, the arcuate nucleus and also the ventromedial nucleus, are very intimately involved in energy balance and food intake in particular. Um, cognition. Um, so, unfortunately, in rodents, it's very, very clear. You take away estrogen, the rodent can't run a maze. Put back estrogen, the rodent runs a maze, fine. Take estrogen away from, from uh, human females, they certainly don't stop thinking. Um, and so we're in, we're in a little bit of a quandary as to exactly what is the role of estradiol in uh, the human. Now, I mentioned just briefly that the brain makes its own steroids. 
So somewhere along the line, somebody once probably told you that the biggest sex organ in the body is the brain. It's absolutely true. The brain is just a big gonad. It's making all kinds of, of uh, steroids, including estrogen and progesterone and a little bit of testosterone. So we think that a, what may be happening in, in postmenopausal women is, is the brain is making its own estrogen at relatively low levels, but at a local level and maintaining uh, cognition. Um, there, there are all kinds of very interesting effects on neuroprotection, uh, especially in terms of uh, traumatic brain injury uh, with respect to um, ischemic brain injury um, and uh, various neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinsonism. Uh, interestingly, females, while they are, uh, so to speak, cycling, are protected. Once they go through menopause, their incidence of Parkinson's disease equals or exceeds those in men. So neuroprotection is a very important part of what, what estrogen is doing in the brain. I showed you a little bit about sexual differentiation. Um, this has to do not just with the uh, hypothalamus, but there are parts of the spinal cord that are sexually differentiated that, whose motor neurons exist in males that don't exist in females. And finally, there's no susception. And of all the things I talked to you about, the biggest mess uh, of what estradiol may or may not be doing is in nociception. Nociception is, is the regulation of pain. If you take all the papers published on the effects of estradiol on pain and line them up, there's those that say it inhibits pain, those that say it exacerbates pain, and those that say there are no effect. Take your pick. Um, it's great to try to write a grant in that field. <laughs> Get the wrong reviewer and you're dead. Um, so just to quickly review, estradiol signaling that we talked about today, and I talked mostly about um, effects at the nucleus, but there are also effects at the membrane, these membrane receptors uh, called estra estradiol membrane signaling. But again, all of these two cascades can end up down here modulating the transcription and translation of, of uh, new proteins. And so uh, with that, I would just like to uh, acknowledge the people uh, that actually did the work. Uh, uh, Melinda Smith, who just had a um, baby girl yesterday morning. Uh, Angela, who's sitting here and not working. Um, <laughs> Amy Christensen was, was a graduate student who just finished, and the rest of, of these people have, uh, have been in the lab at various times. Uh, some of my colleagues here at UCLA, Andrea Rapkin at OBGYN, John Quo at OBGYN. John was a graduate student. Uh, and then John Liu, who actually got me interested in, in progesterone, um, which is a whole other story that I want to uh, talk about. And some of my local collaborators who have been instrumental. So thank you very, very much.